Welcome to Babelcom 5. This is episode 4 of season 2 of Babylon 5, A Distant Star. A big ship is nestled amongst the struts of a hyperspace gate in real space. Its captain asks its first officer to take down a note for the attention of Captain Sheridan. On Babylon 5, Ivanova is using a cane following her drowsy run-in in the last episode and relays the message from Captain Maynard of the Cortez to Sheridan, saying it's rather rude and addresses him as Swamp Rat. The Cortez C-199 is an Explorer class vessel and has been out for five years, so her resupply list is extensive. The Cortez comes through the gate and is clearly massive, dwarfing a Star Fury on patrol as it comes in. Sheridan's friend, Stinky, has arrived. By way of explanation, you may recall that Catherine Sakai from season one, uh, Sinclair's fiance possibly now, was scouting worlds for corporations using jump gates. Some of those gates already exist, but if you want to exit hyperspace into a new system without a jump gate, you can't, unless you have your own jump engine. So, this is where ships like the Cortez come in. They can jump into a system, build a jump gate, and then move on, expanding the network. I'm not sure it's ever made canon, but it's likely that as in Stargate, one of the older races put the first jump gates in place to assist the younger races in progressing. Okay, on with the episode. Jack Maynard has been out mapping Sector 900, but was called in to fix a gate nearer to home, which is why he'd heard of John's promotion and decided to stop by for his resupply. Delenn's appearance is baffling him, naturally, and he notes that while it's a lively place, it's not the sort of posting he ever thought he'd see John in. Franklin is putting Garibaldi on a restricted diet to get his system back in shape after his gunshot injury. However, Garibaldi is preparing for his annual treat of Bunya Cowardy, Italian fondue. Garibaldi says there's nothing left when presented with his don't eat it list. It's not a diet, it's a food plan, and Franklin will be monitoring him closely. And the rest of the senior staff won't be getting away with it either. Jack is still surprised that Sheridan has taken this posting, seeing him as a spacer, not a desk jockey. It apparently feels the post is important because the president put him in it, but his subsequent reaction to Garibaldi talking to him about shoplifting suggests that he's not quite got the hang of the intricacies of running a station as against a starship. Maynard and Sheridan regale with Oliver and Keffer with tales of their exploits when the question of life in hyperspace comes up. After the party, Maynard says to Sheridan that he did see something out on the rim in Sector 857 in real space. He saw something blacker than space, blotting out the stars when taking a scout ship out from the Cortez, but his nav officer only caught a blink a change in the star field. But he feels like something was there. Sheridan notes it's the second time he's been told about unexplained happenings on the rim recently, a reference to Jakar's report on Zahar Doom. Garibaldi is making arrangements for his special meal and asks for them to be kept under Franklin's radar. But it'll cost extra on top of his already hefty shipping fees for real, bulky, heavy foodstuffs. Meanwhile, Sheridan is given a list of the rabbit food he can eat to lose weight. Elsewhere, understanding is not required, only obedience, similar to Delenn's original words to Lanier. But, but Delenn is finding that post her change, other Minbari are less respectful of her than would otherwise be the case. She is between worlds. Ivanova is given her food plan and discovers that she is to be the expanding Russian frontier. But as Franklin puts it, with very nice borders. Maynard takes his leave of Sheridan, hoping to see him again, and the Cortez pulls away from the station. Difficult to tell with camera angles, but the Cortez is probably almost as long as the station. Sheridan gives them permission to jump out personally. Discussing the positioning of diplomatic delegations with Sheridan, Ivanova notes that he hasn't seen it himself since the Cortez arrived. His desk is chaotic. Sheridan feels he's turned into a politician removed from his starship captain roots. If one of it argues that running the station requires exactly the same qualities, it's just a different application of his skill set. She's very straight with him, saying that as his executive officer, she needs to know if he can't handle it. He genuinely isn't sure, wondering if it's just taking the arrival of Maynard to make realisation sink in. 
In hyperspace, the Cortez has suffered a blowout. Its fusion reactor spiked, coming back online after its jump, and its power is down 30%. Plus, the damage has caused it to lose a lock-on signal from the jump gate. Without it, it's flying blind in hyperspace, which is not a good thing. Meanwhile, rebellion is afoot against the food plans various. Up until Franklin shows up, that is, when the switcheroos are rapidly reversed. Funny. The Cortez has regained power, but the navigation system is shot to hell. By the time they can fix it, they'll have been swept so far off the lock-on signal, they won't be able to reacquire it. Maynard orders comms to broadcast a mayday on the off chance it breaks through into real space. It does. Corwin picks up the slightly garbled message and puts it on speaker for Sheridan in CNC. Sheridan orders a reply, but Ivanova, the Russian, reminds him that no ship lost in hyperspace has ever been found again. Franklin is examining Delenn to her mild annoyance post her transition, and he intuitively asks her how the other Minbari are taking her change. She keeps the reality to herself, then inquires after the new delegation she overheard Garibaldi discussing the arrival of, the Bunya Cowder? So busted. In the hangar, Sheridan outlines the situation and his, and his plan to the waiting pilots. They're going to try forming a lifeline for the Cortez, one ship staying next to the gate and its signal, whilst the next proceeds further into hyperspace, locking onto the first, then the third locking onto the second, and so on, so that the final ship is effectively tethered to the first. The ships can then move further apart gradually, in the hope of the Cortez picking up the signal of the furthest one out. Sheridan notes that while the Cortez has power, she can fight the drift and gravitational pull of in hyperspace, but her signal is distorting with time. So they launch in five minutes, with both Sheridan and Ivanova wishing they were going with them. Contact with the Cortez is re-established as the Zeta Squadron stretches out, hunting for her. Impressive hyperspace graphics with the Furies silhouetted against the vortices. Comms degrade again and we find out Maynard was Sheridan's first commanding officer on the Moon to Mars patrol before the Minbari War. Just when things are looking up in hyperspace, a shadow vessel flies past Dallas's Star Fury, disrupting it to the point of destruction. It passes close to Kefra's Fury as well, just as he'd established the Cortez's position and he experiences system failures including comms. The Cortez manages to reacquire him and they see that he's firing at something. Maynard puts it together, he's showing them the way they need to go with his blasts. Kefa re-establishes comms, but tells the Cortez not to come after him, and Maynard orders the escape course plotted and followed. So four ships re-enter Babylon 5 space, three Furies and the Cortez, suggesting a Fury squadron is five ships, given two are missing. It turns out that Mr Irwell's reputation as a cargo handler is such that Franklin knew where to find Garibaldi and the new delegation. It's Garibaldi's birthday, and Bunya Gauda is what his dad used to cook him, out of love, even if he never verbalised it. So now Garibaldi does this every year since his dad's passed on. Franklin asks if he can cook enough for two, and Garibaldi grins. Delenn finds Sheridan in the garden, and asks if she can join him, commiserating him for his losses. She knows that they are both going through transitions, but believes the universe has put them both where they need to be, even if that is an uncomfortable place. Sheridan wishes he had her faith in the universe, so Delenn tells him a great secret. His molecules are star stuff, the universe made manifest, trying to figure itself out. And sometimes that requires a change of perspective. Very true. In hyperspace, Kevis thrusters are back online, cracking auto repair system, but he doesn't have the lock-on signal. Then the shadow vessel looms large again but rapidly vanishes. He has his computer analyse its trajectory, and as CNC is almost deserted save for Sheridan, the jump gate activates and Kefa makes his way home, just barely. They toast Dallas afterwards. Lieutenant Kefa gets his position in Zeta Squadron after discussing what he saw and felt, explaining that he intuited the gate lock on direction from the second sighting of the shallow ship. Franklin experiences the greatness that is Bunya Cowder, but may be denied dessert while Ivanova finds Sheridan getting his desk in order as he ponders his relationship with the universe and being star stuff. This episode does stick with me. Maybe it's because it's got Thunderbirds undertones with the rescue of the Cortez. Maybe it's because it's the first time we see Sheridan really question whether he's got what it takes to run the station 
having just been dropped into this position and not really having asked for it. That's also what leads to his common ground with Delenn in the episode. Neither of them had really appreciated what their change situations could mean until this point, so it creates a common point of reference for them. I also really enjoy the way Sheridan starts to blend in with his command staff here. The joke with the swapping of the food plan meals is very visual and works really well on that level, but it also shows that Garibaldi is now part of the mix. Given that Ivanova and Sheridan already knew each other, their relationship is that much easier, of course. That being said, she's also not afraid to challenge him when he needs it either. I don't think we'd really seen that in the first season with Sinclair. His relationship was stronger with Garibaldi, more respectful with Ivanova. That's flipped somewhat with Sheridan. We also see Franklin getting closer to Garibaldi too, which is another uplifting element to the episode. Interwoven with all this, of course, is, the, is this Cortez situation and Maynard's impact on Sheridan's self-belief that causes him to ask himself some serious questions as to whether he's where he belongs, which is mirrored in Delenn finding herself between worlds, humans still seeing her as Minbari, with Minbari seeing her as an unknown. Very unsettling for a Satai, an ambassador, to be so questioned by her own species. I love the design of the Cortez, such a bloody big ship for an Earth ship, demonstrating that they're not afraid to spread their influence. Presumably the other races do something similar. We know things are afoot on the rim based on Mr. Morden's presence in Jakar's expedition. What I can't tell you is where the shadow ship that wipes out Dallas's fury came from, in the sense that I'm not sure how hyperspace maps onto real space. The gate lock-on signals are clearly very important for navigation, but if you have your own jump engine, then presumably you're not entirely dependent on them. I guess the Cortez was so fried it couldn't have tried to open its own jump point, having lost its position. Keffer notes that the shadow vessel seems to be using its own signal, rather than the gate signal. This does confirm that shadow ships do use hyperspace, but in a way that is not normal, and we've never seen one open a normal jump point. When Keffer's ship disappears, it just sort of blips out without a funnel aperture. We know it's a shadow vessel, of course, he doesn't. He also hasn't heard Maynard describe his normal space encounter with, with what was likely to have been one, but he does know this ship was responsible for the death of his CO, so he's going to want to know more. The idea of hyperspace wasn't necessarily new for Babylon 5, but this was the first time we'd seen operations in it and been in it for any length of time. And I think it's one of those creative elements in the show that sticks in your head with a ship silhouetted against these vortices that aren't jump points but are suggestive of whirlpools in whatever this environment actually is. As I've mentioned before, you don't need a hyperspace engine to move around in hyperspace just to get into it and out of it. So the star viewers can navigate easily enough, you're just dealing with some form of gravity pull and a lack of reference points, which is why you need secondary navigation systems to keep you on the straight and narrow. You get lost in there, and it's likely to be a lonely death that awaits you. So yes, I think it's a nice mix of space adventure and character development and continuity. If one of her has swapped her crutches from the last episode for a cane, no instant healing. I've mentioned that the start to the season felt a bit of a jerk because of the casting change, but here is where it feels like it's reconfigured itself and found a new shape for itself. The other thing about this episode that stuck with me, as it has many others, and has, as has been quoted often since Mira Fern's passing, is the Star Stuff speech. The idea that no matter our colour or creed, we are all fundamentally made up of the same core materials, the universe made manifest, trying to understand itself. Just not all at once, perhaps. See you out there.